In this series on data handling, we've produced all sorts of graphs, box and whisker plots, bar graphs, frequency polygons, ogives. But none of them looked like this. This kind of graph is called a scatter plot, and you can see why. There are plotted points scattered all over the graph. The sets of data we've looked at in previous lessons were univariate. In other words, there was one kind of data being considered. For example, we considered the number of beds needed in the children's ward. Our data set was the numbers of beds. We also looked at two univariate sets of data about children under the age of five admitted to hospital with diarrhea for two different years and compared them with each other. In this lesson, we are going to look at bivariate data like the data in this scatter plot. Each item in bivariate data has two variables, two values that are recorded for it. So each item can be written as a pair of coordinates. This allows us to consider two changing aspects of our data to see if there's a relationship between them. This scatter plot represents two sets of findings for 45 African countries. Each point on the graph represents a country and has two variables. The first variable shows the percentage of HIV positive adults in the country. We refer to this as the prevalence of HIV. The second variable shows the incidence of TB or the number of cases of TB for that country. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe how scatter plots show a relationship between variables and construct a scatter plot to represent a set of bivariate data. Before we analyze the scatter plot for HIV prevalence and incidence of TB, we are going to construct a scatter plot using more familiar data. This will help us to understand what a scatter plot can tell us and what it can't tell us. Have you ever wondered whether the marks you get for exams depend on the amount of studying you do? Or do you think you could have improved your mark for the last exam if you had studied for longer? I asked a class of learners to make a list of the time they spent studying for a maths final exam and the results they each achieved. For each learner, we have data about the hours they spent studying and we have their exam results. There are two sets of data about the same group of learners. This is a good example of bivariate data. Each item in the first data set has a matching item in the second data set. We could analyze each data set separately, but what we're really interested in is how each set of data relates to the other. We can take this data and plot a point to represent each learner's exam mark against the time spent studying. The pair of variables or values for each learner can be written as an ordered pair. Once we've plotted each point, we will have made a scatter plot. So let's get started. It will be easier to plot a scatter plot using graph paper so that we can be accurate. To draw the scatter plot, we need to think about what we hope to find out. We need to choose an appropriate scale. For the x-axis, we only need the hours from 1 to 7. For the y-axis, the values range from 33% to 96%. So we will mark off the y-axis from 0 up to 100. Now we are ready to plot a point for each pair of coordinates. The first learner spent 3 hours studying and had an exam result of 80%. We'll plot that here at 3, 80. 
The next learner spent five hours studying and his exam mark was 90%, which is here. And this is what we end up with, a scatter plot. This example shows us an important concept to understand about scatter plots. We don't look at the number of hours spent studying first and then look at exam results as a separate set of data. We set up ordered pairs that represent both the time spent studying and the exam results at the same time for each learner. This is what makes scatter plots particularly useful to us. They compare two sets of data per person or item so that we can look for a relationship between the data. Now, what do you think the scatter plot can tell us about the relationship between the time spent studying and exam results? It is quite difficult to see a trend in this data. Perhaps this will help. If I draw an oval around most of the points like this, do you see a trend now? It seems that for most of the points, as the x value gets bigger, the y value also gets bigger. So the points inside the oval seem to suggest that the more a person studies, the higher their exam results will be. I could place a straight line within the oval that slopes up from left to right. If every point that we plotted was exactly on this line, we could say that there is an exact correlation between our two variables. If the points were all on the line that would show us that they all fit the rule for that line exactly. The relationship between the two variables is completely predictable. But our points don't all lie on the line. Most of the points lie within the oval around the line and they are loosely clustered around the straight line. These points suggest that, overall, the longer you study, the higher your marks will be. This is not totally predictable, but there is some correlation between the two variables. There are also quite a lot of points that don't fit this pattern. Look at this point. This learner studied for only one hour and achieved a 60% result for that exam. That doesn't fit the pattern, as he or she achieved a better result than some of the learners who studied for two or more hours. And here are several learners who studied for seven hours but achieved lower exam results. They certainly don't fit the trend. What conclusion can we draw? We can say that there is some correlation or relationship between the time spent studying and the exam results. We call it a positive correlation because as the x values increase, the y values also tend to increase. But the correlation is not very strong. In other words, quite a lot of the data doesn't fit the trend. So, we have found that there is a weak positive correlation between the time spent studying and the exam results achieved. Have we found a significant relationship here? Although there is a correlation between the two sets of data, this doesn't necessarily prove that the one variable causes the other. In this example, we would need to see if learners who understood the work better in class were the ones who achieved better results. Maybe those who are committed to schoolwork are the ones who achieved better results. So, a correlation between sets of data does not always mean that the one set of data causes the other set of data. This scatter plot only represents the data for 30 learners and only for one maths exam. We would need to collect more data for thousands of learners and then observe whether there's still a positive correlation between the time spent studying and exam results. Even then, a stronger positive correlation won't necessarily prove that longer study hours cause better exam results. It will only show us that there's a relationship between studying and results. If we want to prove that longer hours actually cause better exam results, we would have to do further research to see if this was true. Now we're ready to look at the scatter plot from the matron I showed you at the beginning of the lesson. 
This scatter plot shows the incidence of TB plotted against HIV prevalence in 45 African countries. In other words, the scatter plot compares the number of cases of TB in a country with the percentage of HIV positive people in that country. As you may already know, TB or tuberculosis is an infection of the lungs. Researchers have collected data to see if people who are HIV positive are more likely to be vulnerable to TB than people who are not infected with the HIV virus. One way to see if this is true is to measure the percentage of a sample of people that is HIV positive and compare it to the number of incidents of TB in that same sample. On this graph, each point has an X variable and a Y variable. The variables represent two measurements for each country, a measure of TB cases and a measure of the percentage of the population that is HIV positive. The World Health Organization uses the graph to answer the question, does HIV drive TB rates upwards in sub-Saharan Africa? The researchers asking this question expect the answer to be yes. They expect to find that countries with higher numbers of HIV-positive people also have more cases of TB. Because they want to see the effect of HIV on the incidence of TB, they plot HIV on the x-axis and TB incidence on the y-axis. Let's have a closer look at this scatter plot and find the point plotted for South Africa. Here it is. We certainly seem to have a higher rate of HIV than most of the other countries. The graph also shows that we have a high rate of TB infection. Let's see which countries have the highest rates. It looks like Swaziland here has the highest rate of TB infection and Botswana has the highest percentage of HIV positive people in the country. Now. Let's see if there is a trend in the data. The points do seem to form a pattern or trend. How would we describe the trend? There are many points plotted at the lower end of the x-axis and the y-axis. There are fewer points plotted further out on each axis. Most of the points tend to cluster around an imaginary line that slopes upwards from left to right. We can draw in a line that shows where the points tend to cluster. This is called a line of best fit. We can't connect all the points to the line, so the line only shows us what the trend of the data is. It doesn't imply that all the data lies exactly on the line. The slope of the line shows us that there is a relationship between the prevalence of TB and the percentage of people living with HIV. It shows us that as the percentage of people living with HIV increases, so the incidence of TB also increases. The slope increases from left to right, so it is a positive slope. There are some points that lie quite far off the line of best fit, but not many. So we can say that there is a strong positive correlation between HIV prevalence and the incidence of TB. As we saw with the previous scatter plot, we must always be cautious not to jump to a conclusion that one variable causes another. So, although we can say that there is a strong positive correlation between these two sets of data, we can't say that the increased numbers of HIV positive people is the cause of an increase in the incidence of TB. Research like this is important for health workers. For example, it will probably mean that wherever they are working with HIV-positive patients, they should also be aware that there is a good chance that many of those patients also have TB. TB is highly infectious and needs to be treated immediately. Fortunately, the treatment gives immediate relief to patients. As long as the treatment is continued for six months, it's very effective and it's effective for anyone whether they are HIV positive or not. It is also recommended that health workers treating TB patients should offer to test their patients for HIV and counsel them. 
Here's one more scatter plot for us to consider. This scatter plot shows the relationship between the birth masses and time of birth for a group of 44 babies who were all born during the same 24 hour period in a hospital. What question do you think the researcher wants to answer? Do you think we might find that the time of day a baby is born affects their birth weight? Or do you think the birth weight affects the time a baby is born? Let's see what we can find from the scatter plot. Each point on the plot represents the data for one of the 44 babies. Can you see any trend in this data? You can see that it would be difficult to find a place where a line would fit. So, we can conclude that there is no correlation between birth mass and time of birth. The fact that this baby is born at 5 in the morning seems to have nothing to do with the fact that his birth weight is 2,850 grams. What we've seen from these scatter plots is that they can be used to see if there is a relationship or a correlation between two changing variables. The more data points we have on a scatter plot, the more certain we can be that a correlation actually exists. The scatter plot will show us if there is a correlation and whether the correlation is strong or weak, positive or negative. This scatter plot shows a positive correlation between the prevalence of HIV and the incidence of TB. As the one value increases, the other also increases. This is a strong positive correlation because most of the points lie on or close to the line of best fit. This scatter plot shows a weak positive correlation between the number of hours learners spent studying for a maths exam and their exam results. The points are loosely clustered around the line of best fit. This scatter plot shows that there is no correlation between the time a baby is born and the baby's birth weight. Once we've seen what kind of correlation there is between two variables, we still need to consider whether the one event causes the other event, or does the one event mostly occur in the presence of the other event. In other words, when we find that there is a correlation, we still have to think carefully about how we can interpret this. In this lesson, I have not shown you a scatter plot with a negative correlation. I'm going to leave that for you to work out in the task. Research was done on a group of 15 children under the age of 12 to see if there's a relationship between the average number of hours they sleep per night and their age. Draw a scatter plot from the data and explain why this is a negative correlation. Then, draw conclusions about this relationship. Join us next time when we will bring you more data handling.